following the laying down of the South Carolina class, the U.S. Navy immediately began drawing up designs to create an improved version of the ship that would follow it. By this point, HMS Dreadnought was in the water and her true characteristics were known to the world, something that would benefit the U.S. Navy tremendously as they now had a good idea of what modifications their previous design would need to be up to par with what they perceived as a far superior ship to the South Carolinas. This ironically enough was a false notion, as Dreadnought was only directly superior to the South Carolinas in speed, while their new turret arrangement and superior armor and compartmentalization gave them a leg up on the British battleship. The arms race was on, however, and the U.S. Navy knew they couldn't risk falling behind. Finally pushing Congress to give up on trying to limit the size of battleships in their bills authorizing construction, designers were now free to create ships that could be far more practical. The nature of the Dreadnought arms race was one of swift technological innovation, often occurring before a ship was even completed such that by the time it hit the waters, it may already be inferior to those that were in service in other navies. As such, speed was critical, and the U.S. Navy understood this early on, with the design for the follow-on to the South Carolinas ready as early as 1905. These ships were markedly superior to their predecessors. They still retained the super-firing turret arrangement, but added an extra gun between the rear super-firing turrets that faced towards the superstructure. This meant that the second class of U.S. dreadnoughts carried a 10-12-inch gun broadside, superior to the first two British classes, and arguably to the third one as well. The U.S. Navy had achieved this greater firepower by lengthening the hull, something they had been able to do as a result of being released from the design constraints by Congress. The ships would be 60 feet longer than the South Carolina class, and 4,000 tons heavier at standard load. One of the more interesting features incorporated into the class would be an early version of the bulbous bow concept. The ships would be dubbed the Delaware class, and would comprise two units, USS Delaware and USS North Dakota. The class carried 10 12-inch guns as the primary armament, with 14 5-inch guns comprising the secondary battery. A few saluting guns and a pair of 21-inch submerged torpedo tubes completed the weapons outfit. Armor would again be extensive, with the main belt ranging from 9 to 11 inches. Lower casemates were protected by 8 to 10 inches of armor, with upper casemates shielded by 5 inches. Barbettes had 8 to 10 inches of protection, with turret faces encased in 12 inches of armor. The conning tower had 11 inches of armor, and the decks 2 inches, rounding out the protection scheme. Propulsion had improved slightly, but again was problematic. Delaware used the old triple expansion engine, while North Dakota received the newer steam turbine. However, both ships still managed to make a top speed of 21 knots. Delaware was also different from previous reciprocating engine battleships in that her triple expansion engines were equipped with a forced lubrication system rather than the older gravity system enabling the ship to run at top speed for 24 hours without the need of engine repair. This marked a major shift from the older engines, which had a tendency to fall apart if run for too long. Finally, the USN had made long endurance a priority, recognizing that her main possible enemies were many thousands of miles away. Thus, they would have a range of 6,000 nautical miles at 10 knots, which would be the cruising speed for all dreadnoughts to come. Both ships would be laid down in late 1907 and completed in 1910. They had the standard pre-war career of most American battleships, staying on the East Coast and sailing to the Caribbean to make big stick diplomacy cruises. Delaware would receive more action than her sister, taking part in the Second Battle of Veracruz in 1914, and after war was declared in 1917, joining Admiral Hugh Rodman's Battleship Division 9 and sailing across the Atlantic to join up with the Grand Fleet. Forming the 6th Battle Squadron, Delaware would unfortunately not get to see the German High Seas Fleet surrender, as she was called back to home waters in mid-1918. After the Washington Naval Treaty, both ships were phased out of service and took part in various training and target duties before finally being broken up. The class that followed the Delawares were, in the tradition of the day, extremely similar, having only minor improvements. They were nearly identical in dimensions, and other than carrying two more 5-inch guns and a slightly thinner deck by half an inch of armor, possessed the same armor and armament as their predecessors. Slight rearrangements to superstructure were made, but their biggest achievement was the use of Parson steam turbines. These powered the ships to a standard top speed of 21 knots. It is important to note at this point that the U.S. Navy had made speed uniformity another priority in its battleships, as it believed that the ships that were faster or slower than others would hinder fleet operations. Thus, the standard class concept was born. The ships that would become the Florida class were laid down in 1909 and completed in 1911. There would again be two ships, USS Florida and USS Utah. 
both ships took part in the Second Battle of Veracruz, helping to land over 1,000 sailors and marines. Florida would be sent to operate with the Grand Fleet, while Utah went to Europe, stationed in Bantry Bay in Ireland. Both ships, for the first time on this channel, survived the Washington Naval Treaty. It was at this point that their careers took separate paths. Florida was converted into a training ship and was ordered to be scrapped under the London Naval Treaty of 1930. Utah, meanwhile, underwent a partial modernization after which she was assigned to the U.S. scouting fleet. London would put an end to her days in active service when the treaty forced her to be disarmed. She was then converted into a remote control targeting ship and was serving this role in the early 30s. Then her career got even stranger, as she was again converted into an anti-aircraft gunnery training ship. Unfortunately for her crew, they were transferred to Pearl Harbor in late 1941. On December 7th, the Imperial Japanese Navy launched its surprise attack on the U.S. forces stationed in Pearl Harbor. There, Utah was hit by two torpedoes, swiftly capsizing. Unlike most of the other ships that were sunk, she would remain on the sandy bottom where she rests to this day. The two classes, when completed, represented the continuing trend for the U.S. of building some of the most powerful warships in the world. These vessels were ahead of their British and German contemporaries in many respects when they were completed and were only just the tip of the American iceberg. Thank you so much for watching. If you have a suggestion for a future video, please leave it in the comments below.